Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter. I'm the founder and the CEO of Global Minded. We create a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, underrepresented and first generation to college into the education, economic mobility, employment and leadership pipeline. We have had the great honor the last uh, few years to work with the people who um, composed the panel today for today's topic. They work with a National Science Foundation funded grant for something called the First Two Network. So they, they focus on the first to college, rural students and STEM students at the different West Virginia universities. So we're really delighted to be able to have them here. And uh, while we wish we were with them in person this year, we look forward to being in person with them next year. And it's my pleasure to introduce the person leading this panel and the person who's really been um, at the helm with the work between Global Minded and this organization the last few years, Dr. Erica Harvey. She's a professor of chemistry at Fairmont State University, and she's been named one of five uh, finalists for the Faculty Merit Foundation Annual Professor of the Year. Uh, she was nominated by Academic Affairs for her work uh, outside of the classroom, which is extensive, as you will experience today. So she joined the Fairmont State University faculty in 1994 as an assistant professor of chemistry and in 2002 was named full professor. From 2005 to 2007, she served as the interim chair of the Department of Biology, Chemistry, and Geoscience, and director of strategic planning and assessment from 2007 to 2010. You will see that Erica has a really wide range of capabilities, and one of the things we work with our first-gen students on is to develop a number of different gears for their leadership so that they can be valuable in a variety of different capacities. So Erica, thank you for being such an incredible role model to the students you work with and for organizing today's panel. We're very much looking forward to it. Welcome. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, we uh, at First Two Network, we're so happy to get connected with an organization like Global Minded that just feels like we have the same synergy and passion for putting students at the center. And so um, welcome also to our online audience members today. I am going to start sharing my screen and show you our presentation uh, so you can meet us. <laughs> First Two Network um, is an alliance of West Virginia students, educators, scientists, industry reps, and shareholders from across the state. Working together, we're trying to improve the success of rural, first generation, and other underrepresented college students who are pursuing STEM degrees. First Two is funded by the National Science Foundation National Includes program, which you'll hear more about um, during this session. First two is using a model for approaching systemic change known as a networked improvement communities and first generation students are at the center of our work. It's my pleasure to introduce our diverse group of panelists today. Collectively, we will share about different aspects of this multifaceted approach to systemic change because that is our goal to change the system for success for rural first generation students. We invite you to share a little about yourselves um, by answering our poll question, which Catherine is gonna share with you. Um, do you identify as first gen? First Two Network defines first generation status as meaning that neither parent had a bachelor's degree when you started college. Both Koi and Adam are first generation to college. That's what their gold stars mean. And the rest of us identify as first gen allies. So Koi Smith, is a rising senior biology major from Marshall University who will speak to the student perspectives on each part of the project today. He's deeply involved in First Two Network, having served as a mentor and designer for our summer immersive experience at Marshall University last summer, a representative to the capacity working group and chair of the student leadership working group. He's currently studying hard for the MCAT, which he will take at the end of June. Eric, I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, I think you need to move, um, you need to change out of uh, video optimization. It's quite blurry on our end. Thank you. Thank you so much. But we've, got the poll, we've got the poll open right now, so please keep coming, um, keep those poll votes coming in. I'll keep the poll open for another 10 seconds. And is that a better? All right. Yes, um, thank you. And that was Catherine Williams. 
<laughs> uh, Catherine is a teaching assistant professor of physics and astronomy at West Virginia University, and she also has been involved with FIRST2 in various capacities since we started in 2016. She and Coy will be sharing about initiatives from the faculty student engagement working group being carried out in a variety of undergraduate institutions and settings across the state. Tim Podkul is our research lead from SRI International. He is the director of the NSF, the National Science Foundation Includes Coordination Hub, which coordinates all the National Science Foundation Includes alliances across the nation. He's also a really great down-to-earth guy who has been helpful to our network since we first started in June of 2016. He'll help frame the Includes concept, the ideas of improvement science and systemic change, and the structures that help support successful change work. And Adam Smith, is a research chemist at the Comores Washington Works facility in West Virginia and a first gen Fairmont State chemistry alum. When I heard the 1994, uh, Adam and I smiled at each other because that, uh, I think that's right around then is when he was in school. Um, sorry to out you on that, Adam. He's been involved each year since 2016 and last year actually hosted a group of rising freshmen and mentors at Comores for three days. He and Coy will share about our immersive experience change idea, a two week summer research internship for rising freshmen. This presentation overall will describe the national, um, includes national network and highlight first two network initiatives directed at systems change, including work in faculty student engagement, immersive research experiences and student leadership. Our project also includes groups um, addressing college readiness and capacity building as well as original research into factors influencing rural and first generation student success in STEM majors. And what did we find out? Wow, so 64% of us are first gen and a, a third of us are first gen allies and I wanna be proud about that too. And can everybody see that, those results or do I need to share them? I shared them while you were introducing us. Okay, thank you. The problem that we are trying to solve in our state is that only three out of 10 first generation students in West Virginia who start college wanting and planning to major in STEM are still majoring in STEM after two years. Since STEM graduates do and can in the future contribute significantly to the economic vitality of West Virginia, this is a problem not only for those of us who care that people get to do what they want with their lives, but it's also a problem that has the attention of lawmakers, industry partners, and nonprofits alike. Our aim is to double that percentage um, from 30% who complete a, a four-year STEM degree within four years from 30% up to 60%. And our vision for how to accomplish that is to catalyze or coalesce, um, maybe as a better word, a sustainable statewide network to improve STEM persistence, particularly among rural first-generation college students, but we know that what we do to improve the situation for our students will also change it for all students. The context for this work, and the reason I have these maps on the side, is that West Virginia is a state with a total of 1.8 million people. And for context, that is about the number of people who have now tested positive for coronavirus. And as you can see on the upper map, a significant portion of the state has one to 10 people per square mile. The bottom map shows where the first two network partner organizations are, and you can see that it actually matches the population density pretty well. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Koi for a student perspective on what the problem is. Uh, thanks, Dr. Harvey. Uh, so my name is Koi Smith. Um, I'm a biology major at Marshall University in, uh, in Huntington, West Virginia. I grew up in a small unincorporated rural town called Ona. Before college, I lived in a, a small house with my mother, which is uh, pictured on the slide here. Um, although my mother did not have a bachelor's degree, she tried very hard to prepare me for college. However, without this prior knowledge of what she did while in college, I started to step behind most other students, or so I thought. In May of 2019, I joined the program of First Two Network. This was the end of my sophomore spring, and a lot had taken place in my college education. A lot of it being struggles, doubts, and thoughts such as, am I really cut out for a STEM major, and perhaps I should change. When I joined the First Two Network, I just had my roughest semester as a college student, only receiving a 2.98. However, since I joined the network, 
I've had a GPA of 4.0 in the summer, 3.8 in the fall, and then a 3.8 this spring. While taking more rigorous courses and balancing athletics and work. Why such a dramatic change? I thought the only difference between me in the spring and me in the summer of my sophomore year was first two. I'm thankful first two and how they stepped in in my life. They showed me that I am not alone in this problem and that this is a common thought among students. Most of all, they showed me my voice. If you look at some of the quotes here, these are how other students in the network have felt while in college before first two stepped in their lives. We see common issues such as fear of communication with professors, a fear of failing, and feelings of being lost and not in control of their own future. However, I can personally say that first two has changed this. This network has restored a power into students' hands, a power that has made us stop feeling like imposters and has made us understand professors are here to help us and we can help them as well. And that's why student voice needs to be at the center. Uh, we approach this work with some overarching strategies that are informed by both system, st systemic change theories and also includes principles. Um, first, rather than just inventing um, new solutions, we are connecting pockets of work that are already showing success in helping STEM students succeed during the critical first two years of college. And by connecting, we mean moving beyond talking into joint action. We are also creating new solutions with student voice at the center. It's not to students and it's not for students. It's with students, acknowledging their central irreplaceable role in building and testing solutions that will require institutional change. We use built-in mechanisms for continuous improvement we start with the need or problem, identify what changes are likely to have significant impact, then try those changes and see if they work. It's the scientific method. Rapid testing and embracing the learning that comes from either failure or success is very freeing. And at the end, we choose to adopt, adapt, or abandon a, a change idea that we had based on whether it worked. We are focused on building sustainability from the very beginning with an anchor organization called a backbone organization in the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission's Division of Science and Research. Cross-sector involvement from universities, industry partners, nonprofit organizations, state agencies, involvement of diverse in individual stakeholders, also faculty, students, and community representatives are key. And finally, we have some principles, um, philosophical principles of transparency, all working group meetings are open and recorded. The structure of the organization is very flat. Collaboration is key, and we each focus on making changes within our own locus of control, which is hard for those of us who can see problems in other parts of the system to realize that we need to work on the problems in our own parts of the system. And for that, I will turn you over to Tim. Well, I won't, I'll have Koi talk one more time. Sorry, Koi. So as first two uh, said, as Erica said before, first two realizes that students are imperative to the success of this network. Um, this is why first two has been putting students' voices front and center for all the network, the state, and the world to hear. This is why first two has student voices at every level of our program by letting us be in working groups, uh, helping us design immersive experiences, and let us create and lead campus clubs. Students are essential to first two sustainability by helping, uh, helping them review grants written by professors on plans how to, how to increase student success. We make connections to industry and potential funders, and, and our, most importantly, we contact our legislators. Students are our future leaders, and First Two recognizes this and helps push us to our highest potential. Our most, like Erica said, while most others try to fix the problems for students, First Two wants to fix the problems with students. By doing this, they not only help directly find the issues that we need to fix, but help mold us into the future leaders we need to be to continue this promotion of success in STEM for everyone. And then I'll pass it over to Tim. Thank you, Koi. Um, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context. Um, there's a larger network within which this first two initiative is happening. Um, and uh, I just wanted to introduce you to the network and tell you a little bit about some of the supports that are in place. Um, to help this work move ahead and um, create connections between the work that's happening in West Virginia to a larger movement that's happening at the national level. Um, 
This work is happening within something called the NSF Includes National Network. Um, the National Science Foundation Includes program is one of the 10 big ideas at the National Science Foundation, and it's focused on catalyzing the STEM enterprise to work collaboratively for inclusive change that results in a STEM workforce that reflects the population of this nation. NSF Includes is creating a national network of networks inspired through collaborative efforts to increase the active participation of those who have been historically underrepresented and underserved in the STEM enterprise. The national network includes other NSF funded projects, scholars engaged in broadening participation research, other federal agencies, eight other federal agencies um, that collaborate to support broadening participation of STEM within their own agency initiatives, philanthropies, industry partners, as you'll hear more about in this presentation, um, other organizations and nonprofits such as global minded and community based organizations. It's not only a core belief um, in the broadening participation space that broadening participation and diversity is important, but it's also a long standing core tenant of US policy and understanding that diversity really catalyzes innovation. And this is what a lot of these projects that first two and others that are working alongside first two are really are about. Next slide, please. The Includes Coordination Hub, which is um, the organization that I direct, um, really facilitates the activities needed to build and maintain a strong NSF Includes national network. And this work includes communications, technical assistance, and efforts aimed at increasing visibility at both the project and national network level. Our primary goal uh, is to strengthen a common vision to improve equity and inclusion in STEM, broker connections among NSF Includes Network members and across sectors, measure progress and influence across the NSF Includes Network by helping all the projects um, come together and share some of their outcomes in a common format so we can understand the progress that's being made at a national level. We promote the success of network members and elevate expertise by supporting learning, action, scale, and sustainability. We host a platform where we raise up the experiences and the successes of members um, and really facilitate, uh, facilitate excuse me, what we call expertise exchange um, and helping those doing the work share with each other about the ways of um, really moving ahead and advancing a lot of these really important but often underfunded and resourced efforts. Um, and finally, we advance the field by um, catalyzing action that improves STEM inclusion and equity at scale. Next slide, please. So to help our network members achieve their goals, um, uh, we work to grow the network in various ways. Uh, we have uh, myriad activities, and these activities are meant to improve the capacity of network members, connect members to each other, um, to learn and share, and enable network members to serve ambas as ambassadors for the network and the initiative more broadly. Uh, the four main um, outcomes of our activities are to catalyze and sustain the community interactions to keep members engaged as both providers and recipients of information to support growth and learning. We facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and network development that leverages expertise of network members in service of larger goals of broadening participation in STEM. We support network implementation of critical collective action principles, going back to what Erica mentioned um, earlier, that really undergird many of these systems change initiatives that we're trying to support. And finally, highlighting research related to broadening participation in STEM um, in coordination with a research team that exists within the NSF Includes Coordination Hub. Last slide, please. And so taking the long view here, um, sustainability of the network and the success of our network members are dependent upon successfully building bridges to different sectors that support and benefit from the efforts put forth by the members of our network. To accomplish this, the Coordination Hub develops and implements strategies to build partnerships with important external entities and groups that can both benefit from and bolster the resources within the NSF Includes National Network. This includes developing broader, uh, this includes developing relationships with key philanthropic, workforce, and industry partners to create a broader ecosystem of Includes partners and work with them to better understand what their needs are when it comes to developing and executing their broadening participation initiatives. Our network members at their project level are engaged in similar activities, 
So now to tell you a little bit more, uh, the next speaker will be Adam Smith, who um, represents industry. But before we move ahead, if you could um, complete the poll, that would be great. The question is, are you part of a network trying to achieve similar goals with a community of support? Thanks, Tim. And I don't know how it was working, but I think I was seeing results come up there on the poll. So thanks everyone for participating in those. Yep, we've got eight responses. I'll keep it open for another 10 seconds and then reveal results. Great. Thanks, Catherine. So Eric, if you could go to the next slide, um, I can get started on my part. So um, I want to talk about one of the main change ideas from the program. And it's, um, it's what we call immersive experiences. And specifically, it's a, it's a two week intensive immersive experience at different facilities. Um, and before I talk too much about it, I just want to introduce myself a little bit more and point out the fact that most of the folks that I've interacted with through the first two are academics um, or, or maybe part of a government lab, maybe a nonprofit. But um, I think one of the main thrusts of first two network is to also engage industrial partners. And that's where I came in. As Erica mentioned at the onset, I, I too was a first generation college student and actually had the benefit of um, having classes with Erica. But um, I'm very, very proud to be part of this organization now from the industrial side. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of good synergies between um, industry, industrial partners and this thrust. Um, because it's not just about the education, it's about what you do after you get this education that we're really trying to push students through. And part of that is to maybe have them see the end, uh, you know, have that, have that goal, see the end at, from the beginning and to have something to really help motivate them. Um, so anyway, these immersive experiences, um, six of them last year um, were at colleges and universities. We did have one in a government lab at Green Bank Observatory, um, one at a nonprofit, High Rocks, and then one opportunity, um, actually it was a joint opportunity with Fairmont State where it was a two week program. Most of that time was spent at Fairmont State, but then we had three days uh, at the Comores Company uh, in Washington, West Virginia, which is right around Parkersburg. And Camores, you may not know, it's a um, relatively new company. It was spun off from DuPont, actually, in 2015. And we make products like Teflon, Viton, Crytox, and Atheon. But um, really trying to change the view of what a chemical company can do. And it's, it's all about balancing, you know, the essential chemistry that, that helps run our everyday lives with being more responsible to, to our environment. But the program itself at, at Kimor's, again, the three days was, it's, it's just a win-win really uh, in the truest sense of the word. Um, I think it was a very beneficial for the students, but then also uh, for Kimor's as well. So if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about what we actually did. Do, so the, the, the good thing, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I see that. Yeah, so um, before we do that, let's, let's address this poll. Um, what sector do you represent? And again, I'm, I'm imagining the, the majority would be um, some form of education, higher ed, K-12 education, but I'd be very curious to see um, what other boxes we can check there. Thanks. My toolbar was covering up the very bottom of my slide, so I have to make sure I move my mouse out of the, out of the way. Um, so what did we do at Comores? Well, fortunately, we had enough time to prepare, and I think we had a really good program set up. Again, it was very, very... Um, extensive, <laughs> very, very rigorous, but um, I think it was very, very valuable. So we, we actually had a real life, what I'll call real life project um, that we needed to work on at, at Comores and the students weren't just shadowing, they were actually doing. Um, they were able to measure, tabulate, analyze, and then present data that was actually used to make a decision on a, on a um, close to a million dollar project actually. So I need to minimize that. Um, and throughout their time, they were able to interact with operators, technicians, engineers, chemists, and again, management during the presentation phase. Um, took a bus tour of the facility, um, you know, manufacturing site. A lot of, a lot of students, especially um, at that age in their career, don't have the opportunity to get onto a facility. And they were just amazed at how it was sort of like a small town with lots of different roles. Um, and then we had a, at the end of the at the end of the time we had a uh, resume building workshop with our human resources director. And again, I think that was just very 
very valuable experience to, so that the students could see what, you know, what the person on the other side of the table really is expecting or, or hoping for when it comes to, uh, to, to the right resume. So the picture on the right is just actually right outside of the cafeteria one day on site. But um, again, I, th I think it was, it was an awesome experience. So I think if you go to the next slide, we can talk about, yeah, so, so there's, there's two different points of view. One is from the, the student side and then the student mentor side. Um, and then the other side is, is, is the industrial point of view. And so I think um, at this point, we'll let Coy talk about um, his experience as a student mentor at, a, uh, at an immersion experience actually at, at Marshall this past year. As I said before, uh, first to allow students to be a huge part of this planning of the immersive experiences. Um, I was be able to mentor for the summer immersion program at Marshall University uh, last summer, which was led by our site leader, uh, Dr. Mike Thornton, and two other mentors, uh, Caleb Clark and Hannah Carrion. When we started planning, Dr. Norton really embraced the first two networks ideals and highly valued our opinions and asked us to create a list of issues that we commonly faced as students and ways that we can, uh, the program could help solve these issues. So the three common issues that we thought that were most prominent in ourselves and in other students throughout our education um, was trouble in communication uh, with professors, potential employers, and even other students. A, a lack of support groups for these students. And lastly, it was a whole new environment, not just only the difference between high school to college and learning, but in living situations, and for some students, new cities or even states. So to try and solve these issues, we wanted to create a cohort with these students um, and tell them our struggles and how we overcame them. We invested time into bonding, and now we have an amazing first two group, not only on our campus, but across the state. Next, we wanted to expose uh, students to new norms that, they, that would come with college. So we gave them the opportunity to stay on camp college campus in the dorms, eat in the dining halls, participate in research, give them meetings with professors, and expose them to the new career options. Lastly, uh, the most important thing for us as mentors was we knew it was going to be longer than a two-week program. Because we established this cohort, the students came to us for help, and sometimes even the other way throughout their first year. This helped us to be fluid with all the problems students would face so that we would, would overcome them together. Back Great, thanks. Yeah, um, and I see that Catherine put the results. It looks like 89% of respondents are from higher ed. 80% um, of the poll respondents are part of a network and via the ex expertise exchange. That was from the, the second poll question. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad to have Coy on this, on this panel. Um, you know, when you think about what we were able to achieve at the different immersion experiences, I think it's, uh, this is very powerful to, to get it from a couple of different points of view. So what I'd like to do now is, is show a video that we captured um, actually from the, the Camores visit, and then we'll wrap up, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, feedback from the, the participants and then and then I'll give you my feedback uh, as an industrial partner. First of all, let me just say that the opportunity to come to Comores is a fantastic opportunity. I think students are excited to be invited in to a project that can make a real difference. It's clear that West Virginia needs better STEM networks and better STEM success, especially for first generation students. As the First Team Network began to build and they were looking at doing internships at other locations, Erica and others were trying to expand that to include industrial partners as well. And I said, absolutely. I said, I think they would be great for Camores. I personally have never spent time in industry. And so even for me, this was fascinating to be on an industry site as a visitor, but also as a person who's getting to participate in the science. And that's so exciting to begin to see yourself in other first generation students who are further along in their careers and realize you could be there too. 
Timor is, is excited about the opportunity just for the education of people growing up in West Virginia. We are definitely looking at this as a, as a recruiting opportunity. And so being able to educate students that are going to become the future workforce in that type of industry, I think is very, very important. What I've heard from the students throughout this experience is, I had no idea these jobs existed. And I think that's thrilling to think that we can have more and more of these partnerships with industry that will let us develop what's possible in West Virginia. I hope that turned out okay. It looked great on my screen and we have another video later on. So I think that I think that was perfect. And it looks like the slides are, are back to, to normal for a regular presentation, but it looks great. I think we can go ahead and go on to the to the next slide. And again, I think you know what I heard from students. Um, sorry, this is Kimor's feedback. Did, can you go back one slide? Or did I I'm sorry, did I miss it? Oh, right. Okay. The particip per participant feedback is built into the video. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, just the students were saying things like, you know, what, wow, I, I didn't know things like this existed, as Erica said in the video. Um, and uh, yeah, for Camor's management, it was a similar, similar sort of experience. It was, you know, what a joy to see young students bringing STEM energy to our site. Uh, it was, it was really, really amazing. So if you go to the next slide. You know, for Comores, one of the main challenges that we have is bringing strong technical talent, STEM talent, uh, to West Virginia. And often the, the people that tend to stay, stay the longest, let's say, at a, at a plant site or, or maybe buy in to the culture are, are folks that are from around the area. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful recruiting tool to be part of the first two and, and try to help help engage the, the students at a very early age when they're entering college, again, to, to sort of as a, as a recruiting tool. I, I think it's, this, is, this, this experience was very unique and we have co-op, we have traditional co-op experiences for engineering students. Um, once they've passed one or usually two years of college and I think for rising high, you know, rising college freshmen, so fresh, fresh high school graduates, um, this is a this is a very um, different experience, and I think a very valuable one. Um, and then also, it's it's nice for Camores to be able to spread the word, if you will, uh, what what type of work and sustainability we're we're trying to accomplish, and really get students to buy in. And then you know, as they go back and and talk to their own high schools and students that are following in their footsteps, um, hopefully hopefully uh, again just spread the spread the good word, as it were. So I think that's that's all I had on uh, the immersive experiences. I think at this point we'll uh, hear what uh, Catherine has to say about some engagement initiatives. Yes, hi everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Williamson. I'm a, an astronomy professor at West Virginia University. My background is in physics and astronomy. And I really represent um, the sector, or the area of First Two Network that works on the class, the college classroom. So um, I'm a co-chair of the first two network faculty student engagement working group. We've got chemistry faculty, biology faculty, really the core classes where um, non-traditional or uh, where first gen students um, may struggle. And so um, a lot of our work in the first two network that's going to support students also needs to happen in the STEM classrooms. So um, we've done a variety, we've tried a variety of ideas and we are um, engaged in particular in integrating metacognitive study strategies into our STEM courses, um, creating first gen student clubs on campus, campuses, um, and really working on further empowering students on campus. Um, and I'll talk about a special topics course we were able to offer focused around this issue in which we were, we hosted a virtual conversation on first gen experiences as part of our curriculum. So next slide. So metacognition interventions are a big part of our faculty student work in the first two network. And really this is um, very much inspired by the books Teach Students How to Learn, which is for faculty and the corresponding book, Teach Yourself How to Learn for Students, both written by Sandra McGuire. 
Uh, Sandra McGuire is, um, she actually, we invited her to our campus to host several workshops for faculty and TAs and students. And um, so we continue to integrate those practices into our, um, our curriculum. We've got study strategies that we include in our lessons journaling, exam debrief sessions, all of the things that get students to think about their own thinking. Um, so I'm one of the questions we ask students to, to sort of self reflect and I'll launch that poll is um, if you um, were trying to or would you work harder if you had to pass a class or even get an A in a class or if you had to teach the class, which one would you work harder for? No right or wrong answers per se, but um, I'm seeing most people, uh, no one has voted for I'd work harder to study and pass a class. Okay, we've got one vote for that. Um, but most votes are really for um, it's that it's harder to teach a class. Um, and so we really do encourage students to try to teach each other. We have an example of a student teaching his pet fish all of his chemistry concepts and drastically improving his grades. And so um, this is the kind of thing we try to engage students in, again, during class time. It actually takes class time to do this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and share the results. And Erica, you can go to the next slide. Um, so the first two network has also afforded us sort of a, an, um, a launching point for new initiatives on campus or to plug into opportunities. So, um, for example, this last year, I had the opportunity to apply to teach a special topics honors course for really anything I wanted. And I said, I want to do, I want to empower students to be ambassadors for first gen students um, because we have this national project, the first two network, and this is a great opportunity to make this a class. Um, so I did this past semester, I taught three credit class um, where 14 students um, and I collectively engaged in work across campus. One of the biggest things we did was apply for a provost initiative grant called Transform This to transform our campus. So um, we sort of piggybacked on an idea of our campus which hosts ver uh, campus conversations. Of course, we, were, we had to go virtual with the pandemic, so we changed it to a virtual conversation, which actually opened up a lot of um, opportunity for attendees that we wouldn't have reached. So we had 77 attendees that weren't just, there were, yes, college students, graduate students, university faculty and staff, but we also reached a lot of uh, current high school students, high school teachers, guidance counselors. And so there was that silver lining of kind of going virtual allowed us to reach more people. And, you know, as Erica mentioned, we sort of take a scientific method approach in our, in our improvement science. So we did some pre post questions and saw significant gains in participants and um, awareness of first gen experiences. And um, a big part of our work is sharing what we've learned. So everyone can find the recording slides and other student artifacts from that at our tiny URL here. Um, and I will put that in the chat as well. So um, that was a really um, amazing thing. And um, you can see some of the student quotes in my that were enrolled in the class, the ambassadors who did this work. They were surprised that it, it really was inspiring that just an hour and a half on Zoom can really make a, a difference. And that there's people who care and, you know, we just need to network together. It's really incredible that students felt like the institution cared. So the provost was there, the honors dean was there. It was incredible. Um, so next slide. Um, Erica, would you, okay, cool. There's just a delay. Um, so another thing I mentioned is um, establishing a student club. Um, as we all know, there's, um, probably hundreds of student clubs on campus, um, but none of them were focused on first gen students. So we have created campus clubs um, across our network. The, this is a picture of the West Virginia University Club with Dr. Rita Rio, who's a biology professor and the faculty advisor for the club. You can see from these student quotes at what a difference that one-on-one -on -one interaction um, really makes. So you can see that it was nice to know a faculty member, to always know I can go to her for advice and help whether that's academically or life in general. 
Um, one student said, coming from such a very rural part of West Virginia, it was hard to cope with the atmosphere. So such a small club, personalized atmosphere helps break down the larger campus feel. And um, that Rita has really taken on students as her children. So this is a picture of all of them at her house. You can see um, that really personal connection so that when a student, one student felt like giving up, um, uh, Rita reminded her of how hard she had worked and why she should not throw it all away. So um, those sort of in the moments when you're low, when you're feeling like you want to give up, um, you have people around you to lift you back up. And um, I'll let Koi also comment on that because he's also been part of a first gen club. Thank you. Uh, so our clubs are the root of each campus, performing various tasks for the campus and for our network. The clubs can expand our capacity uh, through the tools that we're given on our prospective campuses and even with our social media pages. These clubs allow a space between, for collaboration between campuses also. But more importantly, these clubs are a perfect example of students being in, uh, involved with working groups as the relationship between student faculty engagement and student leadership pioneered these clubs. And as Catherine said, before these clubs, uh, or these clubs have become a staple in our first two communities. They have bonded us closer to our mentors, to our professors, and to the industries and careers that are available to us in our STEM majors. Um, and these clubs have started as such events as a, a Marshall University and a Fairmont University, um, which are about two hours apart, uh, two to three hours apart, um, and they're connecting these campuses, which are different in many ways, but provide students with more support and as an example of an event that has just been possible only through these campus clubs. So as, oh, let me back it up one more time. Uh, so as Catherine mentioned in the in previously, she hosted a virtual conversation on first gen experiences. In that webinar, she presented a video that was recorded by our student leadership. So we added a snippet of that video here um, for you all to see, and it talks about how the pandemic and online and learning has affected our students. And each line you will hear uh, may be reported by the same student, um, but every line is a different quote from a different student in our network. So if we can go and play that video. I'm having a hard time finding structure in my new day-to-day -day lifestyle. The biggest challenge for me is that I have twice as many assignments as normal, and I really need to find a job to save for my apartment since I just lost mine. I don't have access to internet. I don't have access to internet. I don't have an internet connection. I'm having a hard time keeping up with the work. I had just figured out how to successfully operate on campus, and now I have no structure. My biggest challenge is trying to do my schoolwork and watch my siblings without getting overwhelmed. I don't have access to the internet. I do not have a reliable internet access. I don't have internet. What my professors might not know about me is that I live with an infant and my grandpa. I have bigger problems to think about. My professors don't know that I'm drowning and lost in every class. No matter how hard I reach out, it's still confusing. My professors might not know that I come from an area where science and higher education is not a norm. I don't have my peers for studying. I'm insecure about writing and struggling with support for school since no one in my family understands my school concepts. All right, so I'd like to open up the Q&A for just some reflections of what stood out to you in this video. Um, you can type a question rather, or I mean an answer rather than a question in the Q&A. Um, and what could you do to help students who are struggling like this? Um, so we'll, we'd love for you to type um, your thoughts on this after seeing this video in the Q&A. And I do see, um, I, I do see one question um, Erica, that might be good to say for the end about kind of our, our network as a whole. Um, are there any thoughts about this uh, pandemic poem? Every, if anyone's able to uh, type in the Q&A. <laughs> I will
will say um, as a faculty member, what stood out to me and you know, I even had uh, even this poem, even though I've been teaching my class, this pandemic poem still hit me again saying, oh, you really need to be there for your students right now. Um, you really need to listen to them and, um, and hear their concerns and try to be flexible. And Catherine, I'll, I'll just say too that it um, really shows how much technology and security there is out there and then how many challenges have been um, really placed in the lap of these students when they're back in their home environments or dealing with all kinds of other things that, that the school environment kind of keeps them safe with. And I agree. Yeah, and we have, we've had some more um, comments coming in that echo that sentiment about how we need universal broadband, how we're seeing really more than that, that just that first gen piece, we're seeing that rural element of our first two network problem as well. Um, Tawana said what stood out was that students need each other um, and structure in order to succeed. That's a really, um, I, that's a very uh, notable thing from the video as well. Technology should be available for everyone. How do we ensure students across the country have access to reliable internet that supports their learning and required tasks? How do we provide more than that students need for basic social media and email use? How do we ensure this is the front line as an equity issue? This is wonderful. Thank you all for your comments that a profit making company won't take this challenge on. The state needs to be a major player. Yeah, that's a really good point. It really underscores why we need our network and why we need our network to be comprised of um, industry as well as academia, as well as the school system and beyond. So thank you all so much for your comments on that. Um, Erica, do you want to turn it back to Koi to continue on with student leadership? Yes. I think it's just waiting for you to click, Koi. Yeah. Um, so first there's, uh, it was important to create a, a working group dedicated just to the students because of this. Uh, this working group embodies the idea that to solve this problem, we need those closest to the problem. Um, And Erica, I can see your video panels kind of oh, okay. covering up the text of the slide. Yeah. I'm sorry, Koi. Technology. Um, let me stop the share and then start it again because I think we're in one of those things that's just going to spiral. Okay, now you can, yeah. Okay, uh, you wanna switch it back to the, uh, the settings for the PowerPoint slides, not the videos? Um, I can, uh, that may take control back from you again. Hang on. That's fine. Okay, that's good. Um, it's not letting me throw up those uh, pictures, but uh, First Two's vision of working with students uh, created a working group. So they created a working group dedicated only to the students. Um, this working group embodies that idea to solve the problems that we're seeing. We need to talk to those that are closest to those problems. Uh, student leadership focuses on a couple of broad goals for students. First Two, uh, early on, saw that students' uh, impacts um, to overall development uh, needed to be a central idea. Uh, so we developed uh, things that would help with their leadership, uh, events such as leadership training, um, helping with the creation of immersion programs with our site leaders, um, preparing them to mentor and research in other areas of student life, the creation of uh, campus clubs, their, um, so their prospective protocols that come with those, and developing the positions and roles in student leadership which allowed the students to demonstrate uh, demonstrate what they've been learning. Uh, lastly, there were speaking events uh, like the ambassadors programs that I'll talk about, uh, undergraduate research day at our, our state capital, and opportunities like that the university is giving me right now to develop our presentation skills. 
all of us which help all of which will help us with our educations and help us give back to this program. Next, as I mentioned many times, communication was an important uh, thing for us to develop and continue to develop between students and students, uh, students to professors and students to their potential employers. And lastly, institutional change. Students are the key to understanding the problem. We experience these issues regularly and within our network, we can solve them. However, to create a lasting change, we go to, to those like our legislators, administrations, who want to help us and build retention but sometimes may not know how to or what way will better benefit our students. And as we graduate and move on to bigger and better things, we realize that it was the help of this network and with it that we have been able to do what we have. And we want to give back. And two of our alumni of the program wanted to do just that. And they're doing so by creating an alumni group. Uh, Tyler Davis, a senior data analyst at Aetna, and Hannah Carrion, a rec recent Marshall University graduate and now will be studying School of Pharmacy at Marshall. They have created the alumni group to achieve goals of recruiting and retaining students to be ambassadors for the network, prepare them for their post-undergraduate lives, help them with professional skill development, and to connect with other recent undergraduates. And then back to you. Thank you so much, Koi. Um, I, every time I see that alumni group forming, I just get chills because it's, it's going to change. Yeah, it's, it's moving forward. And so thank you, Catherine, for just starting another poll. Um, we'd like to know what are you most likely to try as a result of this presentation by First Two Network? And you may be working on some of these things already, but we're curious if anything was sparked by this. Our goal is for, in presentations like this, is to let you know what's going on, mostly to help uh, spread the word and get other people involved in this initiative. We want to expand First Two and our First Two network approaches to other low resource states and rural areas. Um, or, uh, so for us, that's defined as EPSCOR states, which stands for Experimental Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. But we're also interested in other places where there might be good connections. And we're so grateful to have gotten connected to Global Minded because we found people who we would never would have connected with otherwise. And we have synergies that can be acted upon. And our other goal is to contribute public resources that can be helpful in supporting first gen students as they transition from high school to college and then from college into the workforce. So we invite you to connect with us. Um, I saw a question about the website and who we are engaging. We are, uh, we try to recruit from West Virginia high schools um, by having our students go to the high schools and recruit other students. We also it send uh, invitations to students who are accepted into our West Virginia colleges um, and universities and ah, she has shared the poll results. And we've tried to engage teachers with us in recruiting and also other organizations that have contact with students who are likely to be at risk for the same factors. Um, so rural, first generation, and other underrepresented students who are trying to enter STEM fields. And I see that we have metacognitive practices. Good job, Catherine, as our number one idea for what people are going to try. And I'm excited to see the immersion. Oh, this is really exciting. Thank you guys out there on the virtual audience for participating in that. We have uh, contact information both for First Two Network um, and for the NSF Includes National Network. And Tim, do you want to say something quick about your uh, live Twitter chat? Sure. Um, thank you. I'll just take the opportunity to um, highlight that the NSF Includes National Network will be hosting this Friday from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time um, a live Twitter chat talking about engaging student voice. Um, and we have a range of participants, um, many of whom are from the first two networks. So if you want to engage a bit more deeply in some of these um, topics around how to get uh, you know, student voice and those that are supposed to be beneficiaries of programs to be in leadership roles and have their voice at the design table. Uh, we highly encourage you to join this conversation um, and you can follow it uh, at the hashtag includes chat. And 
Oh, go ahead, Erica. I just was going to make some connections when you're finished, but go ahead. Sure. I, I wanted to share this last thing that can be open while you do that, Carol. Uh, we have a wonderful new First Two Network coordinator, Jade Irving, and uh, she came up with this idea for a giveaway for people who um, join a, one of our social media platforms um, for First Two Network. So I'll leave this up and thank you so much for this opportunity, Carol. We are delighted and I just want to um, share for some of our viewers and those later watching on YouTube the kinds of connections too with Global Minded um, that Koi is a student who was selected for this year's First Gen Leadership class so we're very much looking forward to having him be a part of that Celeste uh, shared with me um, while, while we were during the session. And we, Ann Kaiser, um, one of our STEM equity leaders, and I were able to go to the event that was in West Virginia in the fall that Erica and her team put together with all of their students. And it was really remarkable to see firsthand um, what these students shared and their insights, their challenges, how they're uh, collaborating together peer to peer, mentor to peer. Um, with each of you as faculty members, and um, it, it just was great. And we would love to be, um, you know, a, an engine to help your work and to help NSF get this work into a lot of the other states where you've set the standard ahead of time. So we just appreciate your innovation and your collaboration, all the different ways that you are supporting these students. And um, Koi, we're looking forward to working with you and uh, really being able to share the model that you all have set, you know, far and wide at this time where COVID has really made all of this very, very urgent. And it really can't wait for us to be sort of slow in the next couple of years to pull this out. So I am looking forward to connecting with Tim later and finding some strong ways we can do that. So thanks to all of you. And we'll have this on the YouTube channel a little later today. Celeste has been posting those pretty readily. And then we'll also share that with each of the panelists. You all can share it through your networks. And uh, we'll look forward to the session too on Friday, um, Tim, your Twitter session. So great job, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Carol. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.